Okay, so we've pretty much done everything in our packet except for two little pieces, actually three little pieces. Um, the first one is talking about electrical circuits. And you guys don't have a science class in your program anymore, so I put a little bit of electrical circuits just for the math application of here. And we're looking at number 75 in your packet. This is going to be a 120 volt system, which is basically what comes out of the wall. You have the first resistor here of 20 ohms. It's labeled as R1, and R2 is labeled as 40 ohms. Now, it's also giving us there's a 40 volt drop across R1 and an 80 volt drop across R2. What that means, the way a circuit works, um, this is sticking with kind of the DC concept. If this were an AC concept, it wouldn't actually be a complete circuit. In an AC or alternating current circuit, what completes the circuit is the earth itself. You have your voltage source, which is usually, not listed. this symbol is a symbol for battery. This is an AC voltage source. You have whatever your load is or your resistance is, and then this symbol means it's hooked into a ground rod, into the ground. Light bulbs, a motor, whatever. The wire itself is a resistance, but for our purposes, we're going to kind of ignore that. That's another reason why we use AC current for, for powering everything in your walls. AC current has a lot lower loss to the wire than DC current does. Yeah, it's just, it's it's back and forth rather than a continuous push in a single direction. That's back when they first started it. They tried running DC lines to houses. It was actually there was actually kind of a competition between Edison and Tesla. Yeah. Yep. Tesla was the one that came up with alternating current. Right. Edison was running DC lines and Tesla. And this was all in New England in the New England. I believe it was New York. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, it was very, very uh, competitive between the two of them, but Tesla won out. It was a much more efficient system. Well, yeah. No, no. Tesla was involved in several other shady, shady applications of electricity. Uh, after Tesla's death, there was a lot of rumors about him. Um, some things like uh, rumoring that he had built a time machine and some other things like that, you know, that yeah people just like to make stuff up about him I guess and who knows that might be true and hidden somewhere I don't know but anyway so in this circuit the first thing we're asking in, in problem 75 there problem 75 a write the ratio comparing the voltage drop so the voltage drop across R1 is usually labeled V1 and the voltage drop across R2 is be V2 well that's 40 volts to 80 volts, which is a 1 to 2 ratio. Notice the volts cancel out, as they do with any ratio. The units have to be the same, both numbers, and they cancel out. Well, B is asking what is the ratio of the resistances R1 to R2. Well, that's 20 ohms to 40 ohms. And again, the units are the same, so they cancel out, giving us a 1 to 2 ratio. What I constructed here is called a series circuit call this series because the resistors are in series, one after the other. In other words, any current that flows through one must flow through the other. There's no way the current does not get split. In a series circuit, the voltage, the total voltage, gets divided up between the resistances in the same ratio as the resistances. The bigger resistor gets more voltage. So this is a direct relationship. Bigger resistor, bigger voltage. Did it cease? That it dissipates. The voltage source produces the voltage. The resistors, the they're called attenuators, they dissipate or attenuate the voltage. They use, the they use it, yeah. Well, it would consume more power. Yeah, this one would consume more power. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be brighter or dimmer. It depends on the style. 
Yeah. Yeah. But it is going to consume twice as much power. Now another possible setup for a circuit is like number 76, where we have our resistances in what we call parallel. That word originally came from the geometric layout. They are parallel to each other. In a parallel circuit, the current gets split. The current that's flowing here ends up getting split, and part of it goes each direction. Not half, but part. And we'll look at how the current splits here in a minute. So let's say that this is an 8-volt circuit. And this is R1 of 20 ohms. This is R2 of 40 ohms. It asks us to find RT. It gives us a formula. 1 over RT equals 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. So that means this would be 1 over 20 plus 1 over 40. If I add 120th to 140th, I get what? 2 40ths. This becomes 2 40ths, right? 2 and 1 make 3. Well, that's 1 over RT to find RT. Easiest way to do it is to cross multiply and divide. 1 times 40 divided by 3. 13 and 1 third ohms is RT. First thing you'll notice here is that that's the total resistance. It's smaller than either one of the resistances. Think of this. Resistance is the amount of force that's required to push the current through a circuit. So let's say this is 20 ohms of resistance. Regardless, even though this one has a higher resistance, if you think of like pushing water through a pipe, doesn't matter whether this one has a higher resistance or not. If you open up a second path for the water to flow, it makes it easier to flow. So even no matter what the resistance is, the total resistance is going to be less than this one because there's, an ultra, there's a second path for it to flow in. In fact, if these two resistances were the same, the total resistance would be actually be half of it. These are both 20, the total resistance would be 10. So if the 20 and 40 ohms are, say, like ohms, but they're used as an energy power, mm -hmm. how can you use less energy? It doesn't use less energy. Because what happens, ohms of what happens is the, re the total resistance is lower, which means the total current is higher. So that same voltage source can actually cause more current to flow. So I have this one set to zero zero. Yeah. So it's not how can it also be like smaller than the resistance plus one? I mean it makes sense if it's above twenty and less than forty. I don't understand how it's less than forty. Well like I said, think about it as it's just the twenty that there's a gate shut here, right? Mm -hmm. So that gate is shut so it's just flowing around here. It right now has twenty ohms resistance. If I open this gate, it becomes easier to flow. So the resistance is going to go down from the 20. Because it has options. Well, you're thinking of the force being provided. The force being provided is still the same. It's just there's less resistance pushing back against it. It's always assumed that there's enough force to overcome any resistance present except for an open circuit or infinite resistance. It's just it reduces the current. Now the amount of current that flows through here is going to stay the same. The amount of current flowing through there is exactly the same before and after we, op before we open that gate. When that gate is closed, there's going to be a certain amount of current there. It's actually going to be like 0.4 amps flowing through it. We open this gate, the amount, there's still 0.4 amps flowing through here. So the total current in the circuit goes up. So there's more current flowing. So therefore, there has to be less total resistance. If the current increases, the total resistance had to go down. Because one of the rules we have in circuits is voltage is equal to current times resistance. 
So the voltage doesn't change. It stays 8 volts. So if more current is flowing, the total resistance had to go down. It's kind of a weird concept. That took me a while to grasp, too, that parallel circuits, the resistance is smaller than either of the two resistors. It's only in parallel. If they're in series, it's got to push through both of them, so the total resistance is big is the sum of the two added together. Yeah, up here the total resistance would be 20 plus 40 or 60 total ohms. And part of the reason why is since the current flows through both of them the same, it's the voltage that gets split up. Down here, the voltage stays the same. There's 8 volts across here and 8 volts across here. It's the current that gets split up. Okay, so explain how it would work. You have some picture of a series pumping some series versus parallel. Okay. Like lights here or series? No, these are all parallel. parallel. What would happen is, let's say you were to hook up lights in series. Let's start out like this. You've got your voltage here, and I'm just going to use a resistor symbol for the light, right? And then technically, in a in a home circuit, you do actually bring it back to the breaker box, and it's grounded through the breaker box. Well, you can run it straight to a ground rod, but you usually bring it back. But anyway, so this light's going to shine, whatever, right? So now. Let's take that same circuit. We're going to take the light and we're going to stick a bulb in it. Both bulbs are about half brightness because the voltage gets split up between them. Nope, your voltage is set. Here, let me draw. If I took all the light bulbs except that one out, it's not going to make that one light bulb brighter. No, because these are not hooked up in series. These are hooked up in parallel. And I, I've seen houses that have were wired in series because they screwed up. Um, so here's your breaker box, right? You run your wires. Because your wires are a combination of two wires, right? This wire goes into the ground. It's hooked to a ground bar that's grounded outside. This is the power that's hooked up to your generator, your voltage source at some point coming in, right? And I'm just drawing, this would all be one wire with two strands in it, two conductors in it, but I'm drawing as two separate wires. So, here's my bulb. Here's my second bulb. And what usually happens is you run the wire in there, you take your positive, hook it to the bulb. The ground, you hook it to the ground to the next wire. And you just run it through, right? And the ground comes off of here. There's two bulbs. These bulbs are going to be half brightness. Because let's say this is a 120 volt source, which is your standard home voltage. Each of these only get 60 volts. But they're used to 120 volts. This is an incorrect way of wiring light bulbs. If this bulb burns out, this one goes out too. Yep. Those are low voltage bulbs. That's why they get away with it. So the proper way to wire this up would be this. You bring the wire out of here, the wire from the ground. You get to the first bulb. You wire them, the positive and the negative. Bring the wire off of it, the next bulb, like that. Now, if this, what's happening now is you have 120 volts across here and 120 volts across here. The difference is this wire here has to carry twice as much current as this wire does. Yeah, and that's how if you get too many bulbs out there, that's how you have problems with your wires. But these wire, these bulbs will both be full brightness because they're both getting the full 120 volts. Yeah, so the only reason that would be those two would be generated because the energy thing, so the second bulb has to go through the first. Yeah. Okay. So they're each getting half the energy because you've got to split the energy between them. And it's passing through the negative on the other side. And technically, the way they usually wire it is like this. Let's say here's your box for the bulb to come in. This is your wire coming in from your, your circuit box or whatever. Here's the wire going out to your next bulb. What they'll usually do is they'll, they'll just bring the, the negatives together and they'll wire them together. Wire them together. 
they'll bring the positives together with what's called a jump wire, just a short little wire. They'll wire those together. This gets hooked to the bulb. And actually this one, they'll, I guess I, I should be careful. There's a jump wire put on there that's hooked to the bulb too to complete the circuit. Just like a little short, like three inch wire, four inch wire. Well, the, the actual ground just gets hooked together in daisy chain. Usually it's mounted, to, if this is a metal box, it's mounted to the box. Yeah, the third wire is the uninsulated wire, the bare wire. Yeah. And that's, well, technically, technically it's not the ground. It's a safety wire. The white wire, which they call the common, is technically a ground. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's a ground wire, but yeah, it's, it's also carrying current. But it's what connects it to the ground. The bare wire is a safety wire. It's an auxiliary ground. Most, if you look in most electric boxes, that bare wire hooks into the same ground bar as the white wire does. Yeah. It's just, what it does is if, if one of the hot wires touches the metal box or whatever of the light, it keeps it from starting fires and it sends it back to the main box and trips the breakers or what it's for. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. If any, it's hooked to things that are not supposed to be hot, so if any of them do get hot, the breaker box senses it. Ground bars or ground rods? The thing that goes outside the dirt. Those are usually six to eight feet. Safety. Yeah, usually half inch rods, depending on your soil. Yeah. Um, Well, it depends on your soil. Again, you want to get it down into bedrock. So if you got really deep, sandy soil, you want to use your longer rod. I would say usually eight footer is the shortest one I'll put in. But I have some where I've had some where you get down like four feet or so and you hit clay. And I've had to cut a couple off and put new ones. You can't pull them out. But I've had a couple where I've had to snip them off at the ground and put a new one in beside it because you get down in there and you bend the piss out of them because you hit something hard. <laughs> yeah, they're copper, a copper alloy, so they're not terribly stiff. Um, usually a little bit of tin. Well, not totally. It doesn't have the right mixture to be bronze. It just makes it a little stiffer is all it does. A little less likely to corrode too. Copper itself is high. It corrodes really, really bad. The other thing I wanted to show you guys today, the back page 87 through 92. What if we have something like this? This is not one of the problems. It's just similar to one. Let's say we have five pounds mixed into four gallons, and I want to know how many ounces that would be mixed into two quarts. Well, first thing we have to do, the units are different. And we can, you know, if the units are different, first of all, they're rates, not ratios. But any proportion we have, the units here have to match the units here. So we've got to change this into ounces. Five pounds times 16 is going to become 80 ounces. Four gallons times four is going to become 16 quarts. Now we can cross multiply and divide. 80 times 2 divided by 16 is 10 ounces for two quarts. Make sense? That's really all that is about. So, for tomorrow, we should finish the packet. Because tomorrow, we will do unit one test.